I know um, Babby Point is also in the process of looking at being a heritage conservation oh, district. Oh, they've got a website in there. So I don't know how far they're along. Their, um, the city won't talk to them at this point. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's a natural area if, to if be. Scott, if, Scott, if Scott will say, ah, then they can get on with it. They're prepared, they're prepared to um, go for bridge financing, take on loans. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's, it's, it's a real natural because it's a very defined area. Um, it's, it's perfect as a Harris Conservation but, uh, District. Street, like Park Boulevard, 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 Park um, well, again, the, the city is just going through, the city hasn't uh, adopted the policy, but they're looking at a policy which has not been adopted yet, but it has gone once through council, um, that if an area or a community such as ours wants to have a heritage conservation district, that the community must pay for it. First of all, they have to pay for it, and secondly, you have to prove you've got the money to do it before the city will even consider looking at your application. That's what Section 37 yeah. thing is what all is about. It that the money goes to the money goes to the study because it is an expensive process. You have to you have to investigate and do title searches on every property. You have to look at the history of every property, who the, when, when, how they were built, and then you look. Then you also then look at what are you actually trying to conserve and protect, and then you have to put in guidelines and, and a plan how that will be protected over time, and what kind of new development you will allow, and how that's done. And they can be very, very detailed and, and time consuming. I'd say the average heritage conservation district plan probably takes anywhere from two to five years to put it together. And that's consultants and staff working on that all the time. So it is a very expensive process. And what are some of the examples in Toronto right now of a district uh, preservation area? Have the Cabbage Town be one? Yes, Cabbage Town is actually made up of, I think, four heritage conservation districts that they've amalgamated into one large one. Any others? Weston. Um, Weston has Harris Conservation District. Uh, Rosedale has, Rosedale is the largest in Ontario. They have actually two, South Rosedale and North Rosedale. I think that between them there's something about 1,500 properties. Um, I'm not sure. But there are about 25, I believe, in Toronto at the moment. And there are 40, 49 in the province um, pending at the moment, on hold. There are 103 across the entire province of Ontario. So you can see they're not all that common, and partially because of the, the cost. Yeah, and also, part of the cost is because you have to be able to defend it in court. Yeah, well, they do, it is and, required and, and, that and it there must was, go to the OMB. And okay. there was the one, there was the one that, down in Wellham that was lost. Yeah, they, they do have to go to the OMB. And uh, the OMB can change the conditions of the, the plan. And for what its restrictions just uh, on, on home? So if an area was to be designated as a heritage district, are, are there limitations on what a property owner or a homeowner can do to his or her property? I think that is that perhaps a an obstacle in the minds of some people that there are. Yes, but every plan is completely different, and and really the community decides what is their plan and what do they want to impose on an individual property. The, the purpose of a heritage conservation district really is to look at the area and what's important about the area. So you look at the streetscape, you look at the trees, uh, you look at things like roads and, and um, pattern of roads. It's not about individual buildings, unless there are certain buildings that really stand out, such as the churches, the schools. Uh, there might be an individual residential buildings that are large and, and open spaces are extremely and, important. Yes, and, 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 and when the buildings have to be contiguous, has to be one after the other, right down a whole block or, or however much of a block, but they can be valued that, you know, this one is really, really important, this one is really, really important, this one is... Mm. <laughs> If somebody wants to do something with it and come up with something that will go with the rest of it, yeah. that's okay. Yeah, it's about compatibility, so that if something comes down, whatever goes uh, up is similar in shape and form, not necessarily style, but shape and yeah. form, so that it's it's not standing out. <coughs> like the Heinzman House, on, the two Heinzman houses on High Park Avenue, they are like pain of death to 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 alter them. But but some of the others. Um, or less, or less, 
there, there are a couple of, of uh, 19, 1950s duplexes that if somebody wanted to tear those down and put something else there that fitted with what was already there, that would be okay. And generally, property values in a heritage conservation district go up. And the reason they go up is because you're creating a very stable neighborhood that you know some weird thing isn't going to happen next door <laughs> uh, because there are some, if you want to call them controls, yep. careful review yep. put in place uh, that, that doesn't allow for something bizarre to happen to an individual property, that it must go through a process to make sure it is compatible and that it does fit. So often those properties in a district, as Madeline said, are more. If I can interject a little bit, I don't know, I my perspective on the portfolio of the client. Unfortunately, I'm not the tomorrow, so I'm going to work now, so I'm going to give you some money. Yeah, in 2005, there were significant changes to the Heritage Act that uh, changed it from designating buildings to properties, and that sort of very much broadened the scope of, of, of designation. But at the same time, for districts, it allowed for a class of changes to be exempted from consideration of the designation of the district. So it's kind of a, a bit of a balance between the you know, zone, zoning, city zoning, that sort of stuff allow, allows very broad brush controls over development. Um, but as you've seen with something like Babby Point, uh, a monster home can be legal within the consideration of zoning. What, what designation as a district can do is, is provide more in the way of micromanagement um, but, you know, as, as people who want to create a district potentially, you can identify you know, where, the, where to draw the line in terms of changes. There was a beautiful website maybe five or ten years ago called purplepillars.com. Some guy, I can't remember, in Kingston or thereabouts in eastern Ontario, who was dead set against designation. But as soon as he found out that he could paint the pillars of his home in purple, he realized the controls were not that great, and so you know he became a fan of, of, of designation <laughs> just because he, he wasn't aware that the you know it, the degree of micromanagement wasn't necessarily that high. Um, with the caveat that in, in Oakville um, they do have some pretty tight controls, and they will tell you what color they want you to paint the home. Um, being a cultural heritage planner in Hamilton, uh, we don't care. So it's a matter of what the staff feel like, and also the wording of these of these district studies, and critically the, the plans for the districts. So I'm sorry to go on. But I know some the, districts you know. do dictate color materials, but yeah. it's extremely rare. You don't yeah. find it very often, and, or, and it's, again, or it's a very small district that's yeah. really very particular, like a, a time frame. Maybe the, all the housing stock is from like 1850 mm -hmm. to 1870, yeah. so they want to really control it. And that's, I think, legit to do and, that. And, uh, but again, that's, that's just that's politically a result of what you just the residents right. uh, yeah. want as priorities. And because they are the ones that have to drive the, uh, the designation. For example, in Hamilton, we don't have the designation unless 66 to 75 percent of the residents want to designate and are fairly active and willing to participate in that. But there is no magic number. There is no, there is no number at all. Actually, it's it's up to the community, and it becomes a political decision whether or not they move ahead. Yeah. But again, you know, bear in mind that the folks in the city, like me, you know, have to, have to understand that there's some some popular sentiment within that, that wants to support those advantages. Because otherwise, it's not going to work. Yeah. It has yeah. to be supported by the community. Yeah, I mean, technically, if I can talk a bit of legal ease, there's a, a court case, Lakeshore, down in, down in southwestern Ontario. Um, there's a part four designation saying that uh, they basically said that a community, uh, a city council, if it chose to make the principal um, criterion for designation as being the willingness of the owner, the council is, is uh, in conflict with the law. So designation does not have to be uh, done with the permission of the owners, owner or owners of the properties being designated. It has to be considered, but it's not an exclusive. Um, factor. So, you know, hostile designations can take place if the resources are like sufficient. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> yes. yes. Not that we would urge that. Or the firing would be the minority. Yeah. Steve? Well, what would you say if, if people in this area were to, to want to embrace the, the whole notion? What, what would be the features of the Board West Village area that would be considered the unique to it and protectable? 
I think first of all you have to break it up into small little pieces. That as as an area, it's way it's just way too big. You'd have to break it up into small pieces. And I think what one the thing that I find probably the most unique around here, and, and Madeline did um, talk about it, is the top, the topography. Because you go to any new subdivision, it's completely flat. They just mm -hmm. bulldoze it, fill it all in, make it flat, and then build the houses. Mm -hmm. We have an incredible topography in this neighborhood.